Hi, my name is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast of the New Testament. I'll be using as the text the King James Version, along with the Joseph Smith Translation. Although this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort's been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. I'll also be using quotes from general authorities of the Church, the Apostles and Prophets, and BYU professors and others, and uh, every word out of the Scriptures themselves. So if you're ready for a really detailed analysis of the New Testament, you've come to the right place. Welcome. Hi there, this is going to be for 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll read the heading first. The gospel surpasses the law of Moses. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Elder McConkie says, it appears from this from this, this verse, that the practice prevailed among the primitive saints of introducing faithful members of the church from the group of saints to another by means of epistles of commendation or letters of commendation. That is, the saints were commended, introduced, or recommended to the various local churches by their, write, by their written certifications. These would correspond to recommends in modern times. So as we have temple recommends that we can use to show that we are in good standing in the church when we travel from one place to another. Verse 2, ye are, our, ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. Paul is speaking about a process of internalization whereby discipleship is defined not by our ability to follow a set of rules, but by our ability to internalize all the principles of righteousness. Only the Lord can soften our hard hearts so he can write the law in our hearts by the power of the Spirit. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both prophesied that this would happen in the latter days. In Ezekiel it says, I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them an heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Jeremiah says, After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. How can the law be written in our hearts? To me, this has reference to temple work. When we go to the temple and hear the same things over and over again, what is happening? Isn't the Lord writing his law in our hearts? And why is the repetition so important? Isn't it because we can't write down the temple ceremony? Hence, the new and everlasting covenant is written not with ink. Rather, the repetition allows the law to be written in our minds and in our hearts. Benjamin makes a similar temple reference when he reminds the people to retain the name written always in your hearts. The temple is where the Lord writes his law upon the fleshy tables of our hearts because this is where the Lord can teach us how to walk in his statutes and keep his ordinances that we will be worthy to be, to be called his people. Verse 4, And such trust have we through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our, uh, but our sufficiency is to God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, or the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Elder Maxwell said, Clearly perspective includes learning how to distinguish between what is big and what is small. The eminent historian Will Durant wrote of that human yearning for the perspective to know that the little things are little and the big things big before it is too late. We want to see things now as they will seem forever in the light of eternity. Thus, without passing through mortality, how else will we learn to discern successfully what the weightier matters of the law really are? How else, too, will we get the practical and needed experience showing us that the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life? In February 1847, Brigham Young had a dream in which he visited with the prophet Joseph Smith. Brigham Young told Joseph Smith that he wanted to be with him, but the prophet told him that he would have to wait a while. Brigham Young asked if he had any message for the brethren. Joseph stepped toward me and, looking very earnestly yet pleasantly, said, Tell the people to be humble and faithful and to be sure to keep the Spirit of the Lord. Tell the brethren to keep their hearts open to conviction so that when the Holy Ghost comes to them, their hearts will be ready to receive it. They can tell the Spirit of the Lord from all other spirits. It will whisper peace and joy to their souls. It will take malice, hatred, strife, and all evil from their hearts, and their whole desire will be to do good. Bring forth righteousness and bring up the kingdom of God, or build up the kingdom of God. Tell the brethren if they will follow the Spirit of the Lord, they will, they will go right. But be sure, be sure to tell the people to keep the Spirit of the Lord. Verse 7. 
But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of com- condemnation be glory, what much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory? For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing, then, that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end to which he of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Here he's talking about the the Mosaic law being done away. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when when, when their heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. In other words, uh, once they finally understand that the law of Moses has been superseded by the by the law of Christ, then the then the veil is taken away from them. Verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the, of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, and changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Elder McConkie says, as a minor, as a minor, I'm sorry, as a mirror reflects the likeness of a person, so the saints should reflect the image of Christ, and as they progress in obedience and personal righteousness, they attain this image by the power of the Spirit, they become like Christ. So that's the end of the chapter, and we will see you next time. Bye.